Hello and welcome to Ordinary People Walking an Extraordinary Path, a podcast series delving into the lives of individuals who have defied societal expectation and embark on extraordinary paths despite their seemingly ordinary background. I'm your host, Sylvie Barbier, and today we have the privilege to be with our guest, Reiner von Leoprechtin. And so um, to tell you a bit about Reiner, Reiner grew up in Germany. He studied economics and business administration. He developed a critical mind on economic belief system. And in 1994, he entered the European Commission as an official. And now since 2012, he works an indep as an independent consultant. He has collected and developed many practice such as the art of hosting, story matcher, or systemic constellation. And this work is to develop a lasting piece, which has been very influenced for his uh, connection to Jean Monnet. Finally, he has co-founded Frendi Partnership, where there's a number of creative people who accompany its leader in their exploration for fresh way to approach leadership in business, and also the open house community in Austria. So welcome, Reiner. It's such a privilege to have you uh, with us today. Um, and so I'd like to start to ask you currently, what are you working on? What is spiking your interest? Um, yes, yeah, so that people have a sense of what you're up to. Well, thank you, Sylvie, for the warm welcome. Um, yeah, what I'm currently working on is a number of things, as you have already introduced me with a number of uh, uh, interests. Uh, so one is uh, that in Friendly we are inviting leaders or leadership circles, groups, to do a time journey of 11 years forward. So we call it simply the 2035 <laughs> process, uh, where the members of the leadership circle prepare themselves what are important scenarios that are coming up for various important groups for their organization. And so like for the current clients or for suppliers or for the government and their jurisdictions and so on. And uh, based on their findings of what is not unlikely to be the case in the year 2035, in 11 years from now, uh, people will share the different insights that they got through their individual preparation for this. And then they will have a leadership circle meeting on the topics of the future. <laughs> only to notice what feels like maybe not so easy to talk about then, because some preparation might be needed. So that is then the second part of the meeting where people will be back in our current time and see, all right, for that conversation to happen in the best possible conditions, what can we start as a project now so that we will be ready to face whatever comes up then? And that can be, of course, opportunities and business possibilities as much as high risks that might materialize and so on. But the idea is to help people to have a more longer term view and not to forget to put things into motion that might take a bit of time in the course. So that is something we are kind of now having lots of conversations around with people in leadership roles and at this, we, we did a test run on ourselves, and I can say it's really mind blowing when you see kind of from a future point of view of what you're currently doing, and uh, you cannot hold back wanting to change a few things, and that feels like healthy. Amazing! Thank you very much for sharing that, and I do seem that it's true that our society can get some time, uh, and especially in leadership, we can get caught up in like dealing with emergency constantly in the right now, right now, right now. And it's uh, yes. rare to be given the space to sit back and think long term. But it's also a dimension of leadership is to look into the future and see what is needed and starting to apply now what would allow uh, the future we want to see fulfill happen. Um, yes. So it's there is a lot of I hear a lot of wisdom in, in developing mm. the practice. And I found it very interesting that you're doing that also with a community of leaders versus uh, working with just individual leaders. Can you tell me a bit more why you're choosing to work with a group of leaders to do this mm. work versus operating with just individual uh, coaching, for example? Yeah, well, the main reason is that decisions are 
rarely taken in isolation. So if you have just one change agent uh, doing a certain visionary leap, then it stays with that agent to basically find the allies and build the coalition. And yeah, that's harder than have a whole group go through the same process together. And on the other hand, also people can complement each other. So we had been in Friendly, we had uh, uh, quite, a, a, quite a project of three years where we were investigating into the capacity that leaders show nowadays in their, in, in their capacity to think. And we found that uh, uh, what is essential for strategic long-term thinking is to understand uh, a systemic way that basically what you see in one corner of the world is actually in relationship with things in complete different corners. And these relationships are not obvious for the untrained eye. So it takes a capacity to think and conceptualize and to connect uh, various uh, seemingly unseparated issues with each other. So to see there's like a whole that has a gestalt and to understand that whole. That's very difficult for individual people to do. It takes, for most people, quite some facilitated dialogue so this that this gestalt can actually come up and it can take a few iterations before that gestalt becomes more clear. So that is why we are working with the whole group. And at the same time, it helps for that whole group to build like a shared vision, like that shared gestalt, uh, so that uh, decision-making is much facilitated as people have a shared idea of what the future might bring. And in that sense, uh, have that as a route for various decision-makings and management decisions and choices. All right, thank you. And could you tell us a little bit what led you to uh, found um, this group, co-found this group? What what did you maybe see missing in uh, society and in the world that had you mm. co-found Yeah, well, in my biography, I was a European Union career official for 18 years in Brussels. And I had many roles that had to do a lot with uh, public management issues, like how to run the institution, European Commission, so to speak. And uh, in that, I stumbled uh, across a number of difficulties that the, the specific organization I worked with was facing, like how to recruit well, how to give people a sense of meaning in their work so that everybody knows why they're doing what they're doing. Um, how to uh, marry the need to be accountable and document what you're doing with the need to be flexible and fast <laughs> and, and loads of more issues. And I, I was uh, a bit stifled by the bureaucratic uh, take on handling all these paradoxes. And when I left the European Commission, I just found this was by far not the only organization struggling with these issues, but it was like, uh, an endemic thing, kind of like wherever I went, I saw people struggling with the same problems and trying similar solutions. So it feels like bureaucracy is not reserved to public sector. It's kind of a thing that happens all over the European uh, uh, business world. And uh, the, the way out uh, is by having people get into a fresh view on, on how to deal with things and not just try to play it safe and to play to the control instinct to, to basically try to do away with problems, but rather to find a way through them. So the difference here being that uh, instead of trying to have a number of rules and regulations and enforce them through controls and forms and reporting, um, the idea, the, the alternatives are more about to understand why certain things happen and allow people to have their own take on it and not necessarily trying to, to be perfect in everything you do, but more like uh, uh, inspiring people to work towards the same direction and uh, to which, which is not necessarily a contradiction to actually document things and have a proper accounting system. So I'm not talking about not having them. It's more like putting the emphasis more on the meaning making, on the narrative, on the story that people are part of, on, on what is the meaning that actually brings the customer and the supplier and the company together. <clears throat> what is the story that people can tell later to their grandchildren? 
uh, once the grandchildren are big enough to hear the story and 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 how how does it all really make sense and then to look into processes and practices from that sense um you you mentioned Joe Monet in the intro and that he was a very exceptional person uh, in his life to 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 develop a number of practices what later was called his personal method <laughs> like how to lead uh, even if you don't have any formal authority and, and actually bring whole states together and so on so that was very inspiring like how can people be leaders rather than just administrators and managers so that is the key question and in that, I found a number of like-minded consultants, uh, mainly my co-founder, Jackie Tomes, uh, with whom I started working together in 2018. And in during the year 2019 and 20, more and more <laughs> people came around and wanted to join and work with us. So we had now a, a grouping of uh, around 10 consultants we are working with. So it's not a very big group. Um, but what we have is a number of practices in our belt that we can combine as needs occur and that all have in common that they are holistic in a sense that we are not cutting things into pieces and then we need to reassemble them, but we allow people to actually be aware of the whole and then see their contributions contributing to the whole. Beautiful. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about... Um... What has moved you about uh, Jean Monnet? Because I, when we met in person, you have told me a little bit about it. But I'd love uh, to hear a bit more about your relationship with Jean Monnet, how that has influenced your work, and uh, how is it still present today? Yeah. Well, the, the, the first impression I had in the 1990s when I joined the European Commission was that out of a sudden it life was kind of slowing down it felt like everything was just very stable although the whole world was in motion if we go back into those years this was just a few years after the iron curtain had fallen and the whole europe was in complete mess <laughs> like to reorganize and to see that out of a sudden what were kind of soviet states became uh, democracies and the european union was uh, enlarging as people said in those years one can also say europe was just basically finding to itself again while in brussels everything felt very calm and i was wondering how come and uh, i noticed that basically there was not much leadership felt uh, there was not much urgency to really move things there was not much talk about what the direction is everybody was just muddling through and continuing status quo processes and uh this void uh, kind of was kind of what made me curious on, on was this always like that this can't be like an organization like this wouldn't have started the whole thing so several people pointed to me uh, to Jean Monnet as the architect of the European integration and the founder <clears throat> and what he did is he left his memoirs so when he was very old and was around 90 years old he was speaking his life to someone who was all writing it down and I read the memoirs in French, and then I heard a voice when I was reading the book. So this was a bit strange because I don't hear voices so much. <laughs> but when I was reading that book, it felt like an elderly gentleman was speaking to me in French, and I was reading the book in French. So, uh, so it was like the French that I read, as it was spoken French, as I later learned, uh, was coming with a voice. So I heard the voice in my head as I was reading the book. And later, I saw a recording, a little video clip where Jean Monnet was saying a few sentences on that video, and that was the exact same voice. So that was a bit spooky, but it felt like I was tapping into some, yeah, some communication field that was open. And later, when I did systemic constellations, I got a bit closer to this sort of phenomena that something that feels like remote or is from the past or even from the future it can be assessed, it can be accessed to, and it can feel very real. Uh, like in the here and now, uh, there is just another internal sense that can pick up these things. So, so that felt like a very personal call. It felt like I was spoken to directly by the founder. 
And I took that serious in the sense that in his book, he was describing how he did that. He was not just describing the events and feats and, and, and facts that uh, he had encountered in a very long life in which he was uh, not an elected politician ever, but he was working with politicians and administrators and leaders from industry in various moments of the 20th century when uh, synergies between different actors, like in the First World War and the Second World War, in between the wars and to build European integration process after the Second World War, when all these people needed to work together. And he had found ways to bring various actors together in a very human, simple way. And that is what people called his method. And that had the thing that people were invited to basically spend time together to speak about important questions. And an important part of his work was that he asked the same question to many different people. And he asked the question until he had a whole that was coming together, which he then called a plan. And then he was looking for someone who present the plans. So he was rarely presenting plans himself to the public, but he found a politician or a business leader or someone who was credible for that audience to present the plan. And then many of his plans were not implemented, but those that were, they have helped to turn the history towards some positive direction. Um, so, oh. So there was something that uh, his last uh, uh, thing that he did, uh, his last organization that he created, was uh, just a very tiny association with very few members. And he walked around the uh, countries of the very first European communities, which were just six countries, and he visited the heads of trade unions and political parties. And he asked each of them to nominate one person from the surround of the leadership in these groups that would be credible enough to present plans to the General Assembly of uh, their constituency. So like, so in Germany, he met the leader of the Social Democrats and of the uh, Christian Democrats and the party leader, a certain Mr. Ollenhauer, received Germany and he talked about his association and he wanted someone to represent the Social Democrats there and be there as a person, not as a representative so much. And then Ollenhauer thought a bit and then, oh, there's this young man from Hamburg, uh, try Mr. Schmidt. And then Helmut Schmidt became member of the club. In France, there was uh, a young uh, liberal politician called Giscard d'Estaing who became member of the club. And 20 years later, both of them had become friends already with Jomonet, or well, at the time of when they met with Jomonet, and they knew exactly what Europe needed, and they were ready to implement lots of things when they were both leading the German and the French state at the same time. And so, so something that Jomoni did was basically ensure there was like a future leadership uh, initiation that he was uh, putting himself in place to make sure that people had the potential to raise to big influence, to actually have an aligned idea, to have a common gestalt of uh, what the future of the European Union could be and what the next steps are towards it. So that the moment they had that influence, they didn't need to reflect on what to do. They had already a plan they could act on and, of course, adapt it to the moments uh, of the time. But they had a strategic direction that they knew they could follow. And this very simple process just was interrupted when Jean Monnet died and was never taken up again. And I felt that had been one of the most important pieces of the European <laughs> Union's institutions, this completely informal meeting of minds to really conceive what the next version of the European integration could be in a continuous way so that political talent would actually know what to do. Amazing, thank you for sharing that. And I'd like to maybe now go to something a bit more personal, which is, you know, just even understanding like, where did you grow up? Mm -hmm. uh, have there been any events in your childhood that has been very formative for you? um that might have uh changed your path uh yeah if you could tell yeah. us a little bit I yeah. Tell you a little. yeah give you a bit of background and let's yeah. see <laughs> whether we find these formative events among that 
I grew up um, in a family uh, of that was of noble descent, but had no possessions left, no privileges, and so on. So I have a complicated name, and I appreciate how well you could pronounce it. Um, but the that was the only thing that stayed from from that heritage. Otherwise, three quarters of my grandparents there were just ordinary Germans from different parts of Germany. So I'm a breed of different corners of Germany, as my parents had been fleeing to the town of Trier from different parts. The family of my father came from Austria because German, Germans were not liked in Austria after the Second World War. And the family of my mother had fled from the eastern parts of Germany uh, to the northern part first, and then they came to Trier. So the two young people met there who became my parents. And so I have kind of German blood from all corners of Germany in me. <laughs> and uh, what happened is that I was a highly gifted child. I learned reading very quickly. Um, my father had the idea that I should, and my mother both, that I should learn reading that was kind of a bit of a fashion in the late 1960s and there was like a little game that allowed to play with words and see things so so my father played that game with me and i learned reading when i was four and i started reading novels just when i already entered into school so when i came to school i had like a starter advantage because i already knew what many of my schoolmates just started to learn there so i learned writing at school but reading i already knew and I had an interest in many things, so I loved reading. So one of the formative things is that I was very sick as a, as a boy, so I needed to spend a lot of time in bed. And then I was using that time to read even more. So I, I was reading whole libraries <laughs> so, and kind of conceiving the word in my mind, because that is what I could do when I was lying in bed. And you uh, have siblings? I have siblings. I have two brothers. Who are and each three years and three years similar. younger? Pardon? And have these chosen similar path to you or very different? Well, now each of us we are independent on our own accounts. All three of us we went through a banker's uh, period. Uh, I stopped working with banks as soon as I could. My second brother he still works with banks and runs IT projects, but with different banks on his own accounts. So he is like a freelancer hired into running projects and uh, my youngest brother he has stayed with a theme that has much to do with business and finance as he is dealing with uh, uh, companies in stress uh, and he is helping advert kind of adverting bankruptcy or he's doing interim management and so on so he deals with banks a lot who often call him into his work so some some relationship with finance and business is uh, common in all three of our careers uh, my middle brother he doesn't have children i have two daughters my younger brother he has three daughters so we have many girls <laughs> in the next generation yeah and you, I've I've read that you also uh, quite quite young probably did uh, uh, so had went to do scouting like a uh, scoutisme in French. Yes, uh, I was a I was a scout. Yeah, my yes. mother uh, took care that I would see the scouts. First, I was super resistant, but then I attended my first uh, 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 how you call it afternoon with uh, a scouting group, and then I liked it. And I joined, and uh, scouting was very important for me in my age, 11 to 22 or so, so for quite a long period and formative years. It was a way to escape the parents' control, the school control, because scouting happens without adults. And uh, young people are basically responsible for other young people who are a bit younger than them. And so I became like a, a, a leader of a first of a small group, and then I became a member of the leading circle for the whole group of groups in the city. And then I became the spokesperson for the, for the, for the whole city group. And uh, I ended my scouting years as being like the delegate for international relations and scouting. So I met many other scouts from all over Europe and other things. 
and I enjoyed it as I enjoyed speaking many languages. So that was what kind of induced me to find out that I loved international environments. And later it was very natural for me to work with an international organization. Um, but the important thing in scouting is to learn how to be responsible because as you are kind of without the adults who have the tendency to not allow you to be as responsible as you wanted to be as a young person, in scouting, you go, to, you make a camp, and there is no adult. You are in charge, and that was a very formative experience in a sense that I accepted that responsibility full on, and uh, at the same time learned how to really become an adult through that. Because <laughs> I had to, in a way, uh, look for the safety of the younger ones and make sure that everything worked, and uh, had a, a practical concern on that when we went on a journey on a trip on a camp or so that everything was happening in, in a good way so thank you and um i also know like uh read that you um lived a bit in or did a camp in france like um uh, école um oh I, I forgot how you say but in the Pyre pyrenees Yes, yes, I, I, I took part in a student exchange. So where a French student came uh, staying with my family when I was 16 years old. And at my 17th birthday, I took the train from Trier westwards and southwards to c come close to the Spanish border uh, with at 800 meters sea level to with a view on the Massif du Canigou, which is a very impressive mountain next to Perpignan. And there was a school that was uh, a community held by people who settled there already in the 1930s or came a bit later in the 1940s and 50s. So they were pretty old when I came there, most of them. And uh, But I met people that for me as a German was really like healing. I met people who took a very different decision than to become a follower of Hitler. I met people who were resistant and had emigrated. And so I met this old couple of teachers who had been quitting their school in Potsdam in 1933 and through Switzerland had found their way to the Pyrenees where Quakers offered them a piece of land and an old farm. And that old farm had become a, a small boarding school where people from mainly France were as, as children. And for me, this was like a very stunning experience to see a community of adults hosting a community of children. Uh, it was all there for learning, but also to do all the household together, to live together. So that has me giving me my first inspiration to start something like Obenos, where I'm living today, because I saw that the community can, act can actually work. <laughs> That, that's wonderful. You mentioned open house because that was the la next thing I was going to ask you, mm -hmm. which is, um, tell us a little bit about open house and uh, what also led you to co-found open house. Yeah, we do a kind of a time journey from 1986 or so to <laughs> 2012. And uh, there I had uh, divorced from my first wife, uh, with whom I have my daughters. I met my second wife, uh, a Swedish uh, colleague, and we worked together in the European Commission. We found to each other when her marriage was breaking apart, my marriage was work breaking apart. We, st we, worked, we continued working together, we came together, we lived in the same household, and uh, she got sick with breast cancer. Mm. And in that period, uh, it was a sign for both of us, actually, not to postpone important decisions, but to carry on with life. And we both had ideas about living more on the countryside than in the city. And uh, that implied we would stop working with the EU. And uh, so they had the free choice where to go. And uh, then for some reason, uh, because her children were uh, very good in German, uh, although she was Swedish, but she also spoke spoke very well German. Uh, we were wanting not to go to Germany, as that was my country. We were not going to Sweden, that was her country. We went to a neutral country, and that was Austria. <laughs> it helped as well that more of, of our German-speaking friends, there were way more Austrians than Germans in Brussels, and they helped us to find our ways. They gave us a few directions of where we could look for a nice place 
And we came to that area here in the southern part of Styria, Südsteiermark in German. Uh, it's the border area with Slovenia, where the Iron Curtain between Yugoslavia and the West was at the time. And it's still a bit felt, it's not completely gone. <laughs> um, and uh, where we found such a lovely landscape and such a peaceful atmosphere, um, that we decided to stay there. We did like a test travel with all the kids, my kids and her kids included, to, to check the bearings <laughs> in different places and regions of Austria. But that is the one where all of us felt like, oh, we don't want to go away anymore. So we came back and we looked for places. And uh, this place was the one where we felt even before getting there, this is the place. So it was more like a felt decision than a calculated decision. But by calculation, one would have made the same choice because it's very, very connected to the railway. Uh, commerce is not far. And uh, so it's for the, it's not so remote as it might look like. And it's protected in the hilly area. So it's not exposed to wind so much. There's a lot mm -hmm. of sun here and so on. So it's a, it's a place where one really wants to live. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about the community dimension? Yes, sure. So both my, my, my wife and me at the time, we had the practice already in Brussels that people were living with us in the family who needed some other place, be it for, for a certain time, or we often had people visiting Brussels with whom we worked or so who stayed with us. So we had a, commun a communal inkling already in the normal household. So it was very natural for us to say, well, we want to, to not just move to the countryside. We want to live in a way that is respecting the challenges of the future and is respecting natural cycles and what is actually the nature of humans. And we found that the very small family setting is too small. Uh, we, 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 and the, the, the huge families of the past, they are gone, so you cannot get them back. So what is then the alternative is that you mix and bring people together to live together and share a place who are uh, not necessarily uh, siblings or, or lovers, but uh, who make a choice that they want to live together. And as I had the example of the old school in the Pyrenees as a, a working example, um, uh, our, our design was that we would uh, share the meals, we would uh, uh, share the, 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 the purchasing and so on. So we would have a shared pot where everybody contributes from their money, uh, from which we would run everything that is the commons of the place, where while everybody has their own room or their private place where they can withdraw. And of course, people can invite their own friends and I don't need to hang out with everyone from the community all the time. But uh, by being together in a larger circle, people have more connections with different people than they would if they would live just with a small family. So that was the main recipe. But then we had a few people actually joining. And the first community, we had younger people joining who were kind of all from the same age. And that worked for a certain time until one came who only wanted to meet his new girlfriend rather than be in the community. And this created a lot of disturbances that we couldn't handle well. We only found out later that this was kind of the breaking point. <laughs> but the whole thing broke apart. People went, it went in different directions. Of course, the couple left and others felt like, oh, I have been here enough now. And so, and that is also normal for people at a younger age that they stay in the community for a certain period, not necessarily forever. So that was our first learning. And now we pay attention or I pay attention. My second wife and me, we, we also found at a certain moment, we just had done what we had to do together and we had not much left in common. So that was a very different type of divorcing than my first divorce. And she had moved on to Denmark years ago so but what we already learned uh, in that period is that it's important to have my, several generations present in a community for a community to really hold so people have longer and shorter horizons of the stay and also different phases in life that can actually help people to have another direction and not everybody doing the same mistakes at the same time but people doing different initiatives, including mistakes, of course, but kind of that complement each other rather than accumulate. Okay. 
thank you very much for sharing with us some of your learnings along the way. Yeah, um, you're welcome. I'd like to also how you came across uh, the systemic constellation uh, work and how that poured into your uh, practice with your clients. Yeah, this is, uh, there's a number of practices I learned while I was in the European Commission. I kind of had different jobs, <clears throat> but the red thread that I was following while I was there had a bit to do with this first experience, like where's the leadership? So I became like a change agent <laughs> early on. And I was looking for how can this organization be more effective? How can processes accelerate and lead to results more than not? How can people work together in fruitful ways and, and so on? So I had these sort of questions. And uh, in the early 2000s, I was uh, in charge of leading the definitions for a very big IT project, the European Union's personnel portal. And in this period, I had invited people from the learning department to facilitate the group in which these uh, specifications were developed. So we were very playful and creative <laughs> with people from human resources to basically find out how should people be recruited, how to make specifications for IT development and so on. And at one one of those, and, and, and one of the facilitators at some moment told me, said to me, Raina, we must do a systemic constellation. And she didn't say exactly why or what, but sent me a link to Bert Henninger's website. And I could read on the website how Bert Henninger was describing how he did constellations. And I felt like, hmm, yeah, well, let's do a run, test run. And uh, the day after, in the morning, we had a meeting of the group and we were setting up the IT system. We were having people represent the people who had asked for the IT system. And we had the intended users of the IT system and they kind of found their places in the room. The IT system was in the middle. The users were on one side. The people who had asked for the system on the other. And the one group was hiding behind the system and the other group wanted to talk to the people behind the system. And then we knew already oh, the political situation of our project and why it was very difficult. <laughs> and that was just five minutes. It went very fast. Um, and then I said like, okay, guys, let's go move on to business. And then people can, came back and said, Rainer, I have so strong emotions here. You cannot just stop. And that gave me the idea, hmm, maybe I should learn this a bit more thoroughly <laughs> rather than just play around. And I had been invited by uh, another friend who was not from the commission, but was doing practice developments who had invited someone to teach constellations. And that invitation came in just around this time. So this time I accepted and took a course and learned constellation work thoroughly. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. And um, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about your project called the Story Matcher. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, the first ideas go back to the same time when I was dealing with these specifications. And I then found that IT systems that were out there, they kind of didn't help people to find meaningful work, like job portals. They just help people to find another job like the one they already have which for many people is good enough, but it's not what I was looking for because in the EU people had like a lifetime career and I had been working with people who wanted to change <laughs> and they didn't know where to start. <laughs> and the biggest thing that people lost time with before they went into the new job was searching and not finding. So I was looking for something. How can people find what is meaningful in their lives and how can they find places where this meaningful experience could be found? And uh, so I woke up one morning with the idea that we need stories as the intermediary between the unknown future of the one who's recruiting and the unknown future of the one who's searching. 
because both are probably easier in identifying or connecting to a story that's told to them than to know exactly how the new person should look like or which job they should apply for. So I found like an intermediary step for that unknown thing called future uh, that uh, we can actually already tell, although for everybody it is new, but it has already happened for someone else at another moment in their life. So what I did then was like a project where I invited people to share moments of success at their work. And I made a collection of stories that was describing all possible successes one could have with the European Commission at the time. And I have later generalized this, so now I have a bank of more than 300 stories of different successes people can have at work or in life in general. And uh, under storymatcher.com, people can go and register with their email and their name and then uh, do a kind of self-assessment of what their fu the future is they want to see. So they can go through a number of stories and select the ones that really are appealing for them. And as a result, we give people now a feedback based on uh, adult development theory, where we can help them orient where they are in their life now, so they don't need to have a vacancy immediately where they can go for. But that is another application. So the initial idea was to help people to find a new work. But uh, what we have now to start with is help people to find uh, if, uh, their own situation that where they are in their life. And we are also helping people to find a coach or a mentor that can help them then deciding their next decisions or steps in their career. So that is what people can do right now with this. But so the original idea is already 20 years old, but now we have a support tool for coaches and consultants or for individuals to basically know where they are in their life and their inner development and uh, how and then uh, find support to uh, formulate the next steps in how to move ahead. So. And why hear from all these different stories and different things you, you tackled is there's a real kind of like wanting to get your hand in the mud and solving problems. Like what? <laughs> like that's why here is like you have a problem, go to Reiner. He's like, he's going to be delighted to kind of get in the mud and figuring, figure things out. Mm -hmm. What? How did that came about like in your childhood? Because mm -hmm. you mentioned about the reading but uh, I'd love to hear maybe the connection to that, maybe tr a personality trait or desire to kind of contribute in resolving kind mm. of a complex problem. Well, I think the what I spoke about the scouting, that sense of feeling that uh, urge or that nudge to be responsible and not just to, to be a bystander uh, is a very important ingredient into that. And the other... Uh, that I became so much a coach and consultant was actually happening in the European Commission when uh, it was much more accessible and practical for me to consult many leaders rather than try to be just one leader. Because as this is an organization where things happen very slowly and you need to deal with loads of people who kind of are either in your way or on your way or want other things and you need to negotiate a lot. That's something, of course, I learned <laughs> as I was there. But having just one project would have brought me to death because it would never have been happening quick enough. So what I did instead was uh, kind of redefining myself as a consultant or as a coach, where I could be with many projects at the same time and helping people in charge uh, how they could get their project on their rail and have it move. Uh, or if it was not on rails, how could, how could it move without rails and so on? So, so that was how I became a bit the professional that I am today. It was, uh, I had no other choice or I would have been very much bored at work. <laughs> Thank you. And um, I have two last questions for you. It's like, what would you like to tell people of your generation? Like, is My there anything generation. that, yeah. yes, of your own generation, is there anything you'd like to kind of express to uh, people of yeah. your generation? It's a very straightforward uh, thing that we all know at our generation. We have, we have, we have failed. 
We have failed to address climate change already since 30 years. We have waited to get into power. And now our generation is in power. It's the people in their 50s. So most of us are in some way responsible. So it's high time not to lose that momentum and to do it in ways that we have not even more of conflicts, frustration and disappointment taking even more over. So we are now dealing with the symptoms of very late adoption to something we knew when we were young was already very important and had to be dealt with. So that sense of looking a bit ahead into the future and take the future as our beacon and orientation point. This is really crucial. We don't mess this up. We don't mess this up as another generation who doesn't do it. Mm, thank you for saying that. It's very poignant. And to that, what would you say to um, the the generation of, uh, let's say, the kids who are now ten years old? Mm. Yeah, not to become like 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 us and wait too long to change things, but do it right away. It's the moment they can do it. Not to trust too much that their education was equipping them already, because it doesn't. Not to trust our current systems that they are meant to do things safely and like they should be, because they don't do that. Uh, but to trust their inner systems and their capacities that they have in themselves and to find trustworthy people from our generation now they can connect with who know how the old systems don't work anymore and are ready to find new ways and for young people to not waste too much time in dying systems but build new systems and new approaches early on and maybe lastly what do you think has been maybe a belief system or blind spot of your generation that had them maybe not take the action as swiftly? We were well behaved. We were making a career first and looked into having enough food for our family and have a house, paid back our mortgages. So we were basically complying with status quo rules rather than understanding at our, when we were in our 20s, that status quo was getting us even more into the problems that we already saw on the horizon, but we didn't make the link that by just continuing and making a career and looking after the lives of ourselves and our families and so on, we were basically not, not only not solving the problem, but even making it, it a bit harder. <laughs> yes the difficulty of uh, switching yes mm. well, well i have experienced there... pun yeah i was gonna just say is there any last thing you'd like to say well or... there i've experienced something in the european union uh, people have a very good salary and then but they are kind of asked to comply with all the norms of a very developed administration and a bureaucratic system and so on. So basically many people I met kind of already quite some time ago, they experienced what we all call the golden cage. And that is something many, many people have around them that uh, they are well fed, they have a good salary, they have status, they have everything people are thinking that they should aspire to but at the same time uh, one need to let go of that sort of safety and uh, uh, comfort of all that and one is not really losing out so that was my experience when i left that golden cage in brussels and i moved to the countryside in a rather rundown little farm that we had the means to renovate just a little bit but not to make it a palace or something like that just a livable place um that was like a big letting go of all that that was kind of very important and meaningful so to speak before but once i had done this step i experienced the fresh air of real life and nature and uh, my life quality was very different and much higher than before so i never regretted a second to have quit the safe job and uh, sure increases in salary every two years or so uh, to to uh, be in the 
in the ocean of competition with many other consultants and uh, facilitators and cre other creative people and uh, still survived well until now. So I didn't need to starve. I could make my things and could live with also much less. Mm. Yes, the little death, the slow little death of the golden prison. I often yes. look at myself being like, the comfort is a... Uh, is the little death yeah there is something in that mm. so thank you for reminding us of this warning and also mostly of the possibility uh, behind the bars uh, free from the bars of the golden prison mm -hmm. uh, one of creativity and of uh, joy I hear yeah yeah, and I must say, whether we're still in the EU career or didn't have a boring life at all, I was creative in the system. It was more like when, when I decided to look for other avenues, I just felt like I had seen it all and I had done what I could do there. So I didn't want to just hang on until I would have retirement age or so. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rainer, for uh, taking the time to do this interview. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I, and uh, uh, thank you for listening to us, for the people who have been listening to this interview. And uh, we'll follow you with a new story soon. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>